I want to welcome you to the Pro Mindset Podcast. The Pro Mindset Podcast is all about diving into the headspace that results in championship performance. High performing athletes, winners, have this mental flow and have a positive headspace for their performances and success. Join me, Craig Doman, sports attorney and NFL agent, on this podcast. I will interview pro athletes, college athletes, football coaches, and sports personalities. Together, we can discover how you can get in the flow and have your own pro mindset. We have Ryan Hannum. He's the pride of Northern Iowa. Ryan, I want to welcome you to the show today. Thank you, Craig. Honored to uh, to be on the show. I've always enjoyed our conversations over the years, so I'm looking forward to this as well. You were drafted, I believe, in 2002? Correct. Okay, so why don't you share for the audience kind of your background, your your history, and your football journey? Sure. So I grew up in a small town um, here in Iowa, the northern part of the state. I was kind of that stereotypical small-town athlete. I played all the sports. In high school, didn't necessarily – stand out in one more than the other it just so happened that you know I was more built for football than than anything else and so um had a chance to come here to you and I um on a football scholarship you know that really worked out it worked out for me I had been recruited by a, a few of the bigger schools in the area the University of Iowa Iowa State and then kind of in my senior year they dropped off for you know various reasons and you and I gave me a chance which quite honestly if if I had gone anywhere other than you and I, I'm not, I don't think it's far fetched to think I never would have been in the NFL. Um, it was the right place for me to, to come in and, and get some experience right away as a freshman, get to play as opposed to maybe sitting at a, at a bigger school for two, three years um, before seeing the field. And so, you know, those years of actually getting, getting in on the action and developing were, were huge for me. And, uh, like you said, Ben was drafted in 2002 by the Seahawks and went out there, spent four four enjoyable years, and then finished up with a year um, with the Dallas Cowboys. Okay, so your story is unlike a lot of guys that make it to the league. I think there's a misnomer out there that everybody that goes to the NFL is a super freak, superstar, started four years wherever they went. They all went to Alabama or Power 5 school, and they could play for anybody anytime. And I think you're an example – of a guy that had a successful NFL career and were, was very successful in college, yet you just, by your own admission, said, you know, hey, I was in the right place at the right time. And I think that's a big part of sports is being in the right place, having the right coaches, being in the right system, and then taking advantage of the opportunity that you get. And let's fast forward to the NFL. What was the biggest adjustment for you? What was like, I know that you're very intelligent, you're, you're very thoughtful, and we had a number of conversations before you got to the league about what it was going to be about. You kind of already, all, all guys know, you kind of, you know, you you start looking ahead. But what was the thing that shocked you the most about the NFL? I think that what probably stood out to me the most, even, um, you know, in that very first rookie NFL mini camp after the draft, was really the speed and the and the size of the players. Right? I mean, part of it being coming from a, a 1AA school, um, but just the college level in general, you know, you're used to you know, every team you play against would have a couple of studs on it, right? The guys that could run, that could hit, that could that could do everything. And all of a sudden, you get here, and you're looking at these professional athletes, and that's how you know they can all do that. So I, you know, I definitely remember looking at some of these guys, looking at the offensive linemen, and to me, it was like I'm looking at you know guys that have the bodies of a tight end to so just somebody put them on a, a you know a photocopy machine and, and enlarge them. Like I'm thinking, how do you play next to a guy like uh, Hall of Famer Walter Jones, you know, a guy that's six five, three hundred and twenty pounds, and and runs like a deer? That was I don't want to say it was shocking, but that was you know probably the thing that that stuck stood out to me the most was you're going to really have to step it up if you want to be able to compete with these guys. Well, I think the NFL is one of those deals where the the level of athleticism is a little bit higher in college. Everybody can play, but that begs the question. How do you go in there and be successful when you don't have the most athleticism? Well, I know we've, we've talked about this probably several times in the past, but I've always been kind of intrigued by related issue to that is how do you take somebody who maybe is physically talented and has abilities above and beyond what the normal athlete has and then see them not succeed 
And then at the other end of the spectrum, how do you how do you get a guy who was maybe borderline athletically as compared to those other you know, professional athletes? Then how do you, how does he rise above them and and succeed? And you know that's always an intriguing question. You know, you and I have seen it, you know, how many countless times on on every every NFL team, every college team out there. I think there's several ingredients that go into that. You know, obviously we start talking about the mental side of the game and and your motivation and and your passion for the game. You know your your work ethic. Generally speaking, you know, I kind of approached it this way: is I'm gonna I'm gonna put my head down, I'm gonna work as hard as I can, and I'm gonna keep going until they tell me I can't come here anymore. I, I'm not gonna give them any excuse to cut me. Uh, I'm not gonna fire myself by being a knucklehead. You know, by giving them the impression that you know I don't care or I don't want this. But honestly, that's that's what worked for me to be physically talented enough. I mean, everybody, everybody that's there, obviously, has physical talents. So you have to be able to hold it physically. But then I think just that other side of it, to, to show them how much you want it and not give them a reason to get rid of you. You know, I learned how to be you know, a backup at several different offensive positions. So going into game days, I could be the emergency fullback. I could be an emergency wide receiver. Um, I could be the emergency long snapper. Things that I'd never really done in my career but that I saw as ways to just, you know, maybe give me, give me an edge on, you know, somebody else if they're trying to decide, you know, which one of these guys we want on our team. Okay. So Ryan, one of your personality traits is you're a very, very hard worker and you don't get distracted by bling like some players do. And when you were in the league, you were a pro's pro. You, you were one of those guys that acted like you're 40 years old that was going to work every day. And I'm sure you had temptations just like everybody. But unfortunately, a lot of the young guys back then and even today, they get distracted. They can't say no when they need to say no, Mm -hmm. right? One of the things that you did that coaches love is they love players they can trust. And let's just say, for example, on a scale 1 to 10, you were going to give them an 8.5 every Sunday. Every day, you were going to give them an 8.5. They would rather have a 10, and there's a guy on the roster that can do a 10, but he only does a 10 once in a blue moon. And his, his default is like a seven. Right. You beat, you beat him out. So when you start sizing each other up, coming down to cut, you're like, oh, that guy's better than me because you're thinking of the one day he did the 10. And he looks like Tarzan and plays like Jane most of the time. Right. The coaches are looking at what is the predictable production I'm going to get from these guys. And the coaches I know in the NFL are going to pick you every time because you're going to give them an 8.5 every time. And 8.5 is plenty and good enough to win. It's just they'd rather have a player that get, does a 10 every time, but there aren't very many of those. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, you know, using your example, you want a, a 10 out of 10 every day of the week, but if that's not possible, you take the next the next best you can get, right? Well, I was in a meeting where a coach told all the tight ends, he said, just so you guys understand, you know, we're not going to sit here and talk about your potential because your potential is going to get all of us fired, right? Meaning all we care about is what you do when you're when you're out on the field. And so I really tried to you know, take that to heart and you know, be that consistent player that, you know, for better, or for worse, here's what I'm going to give you. And I think that obviously contributed to me being able to hang on as long as I did. Gotcha. Would you mind sharing? You don't have to name names. What's the most difficult situation you've ever been in, whether it was college or pro, where you did have a disconnection with your coaches and you had to fight through the temptation to shut down when you felt like maybe the coach either didn't like you, didn't believe in you, or didn't want you to be there? You know, I think probably the best example of that for me was after, after I went to the Cowboys. I went there as a free agent in 2006. There was a situation where I was kind of replacing the previous backup tight end who had a specific role on the team and was well-liked by many of the coaches and the teammates. And they brought me in basically as a, a hopeful upgrade in a few areas over, over what he was doing. I mean, there was one assistant coach in particular. It wasn't my position coach, but he had a really, just a really strong relationship with, with that player. And I knew from early on that he just wasn't a fan. It wasn't his decision to bring me there, you know, so much so that could have turned into a pretty toxic situation. You know, if either one of us would have allowed it to, this is a person who um, you, and you may remember this on uh, my Free agent visit there. I sat down with the assistant coaches and we're kind of reviewing some game film and they're saying, here's kind of the role you know, we're wanting you to play. 
or this position, and I'm watching this film, and I'm seeing this guy line up a lot at fullback, right? And I'd never really played fullback, and so I remember calling you as kind of the negotiations were going on. I said, Craig, I don't, I don't want to go play fullback for the Dallas Cowboys, and went back in and spoke with them, and they said, uh, no, 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 we're just showing if we want a fullback in the game, we'll put a fullback in the game. We're just showing you some of our, you know, kind of our offensive schemes, and, and I took that at, at its word. Well, then we come to the first off-season minicamp with the Cowboys. We're sitting in the meeting before the first practice, and we're running through the offensive installation and going through personnel groupings and and up on the overhead. Back in the days when we still used overhead projectors, they had uh, you know, Ryan Hannum written in at the position lined up as a fullback. And so I asked this coach. I said, you know what? Just to be clear, you know, we talked about this. You know, you know, am I playing? fullback am I playing the tight end and and his answer to me was deal with it and that's when I knew things were going to be you know maybe difficult so anyway, like a long story longer it could have turned into a pretty toxic situation I basically made a decision that you know I'm here to do a job right I signed on the dotted line I'm here to play football for these guys uh, I'm gonna give them everything I have I'm not going to let any personal disagreements or personality differences come into play and to that coach's credit you know he he did the same you know we weren't necessarily going out to dinner with each other after practice but we learned how to how to function together so it's hard and I think you know the farther you get up the chain you're getting into college and getting into you know obviously the NFL as it becomes more and more of a business I mean you have to understand that that's going to happen like any other workplace environment that there's going to be somebody you don't you know necessarily uh, see eye to eye with and you have to be professional enough to say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do my job and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And, and that's, you know, that's how it has to be. Well, I think there's three issues there, Ryan. Issue number one is being lied to, whether it was intentional or not, you felt like you were lied to and trust goes down when you get lied to. The second issue is teams see players differently than players see players. Right. And, Sometimes your skill set in a certain scheme is a better, is a better fit, fit at potentially another position or a combo of positions. And so if they could break the huddle with you in the in the huddle, the defensive coordinators calling the play, calling the defense, thinking you're lining up as a tight end, and sometimes you are, but sometimes you're lining up a fullback. And so it can kind of mess up the defensive coordinator. And then I think the third issue is what you already said. Players, once you get to, especially to the NFL, if they ask you to be the long snapper or the, the personal protector on punts, it doesn't matter what position it is. It's in your best interest to embrace it, right? So the more valuable yeah. you can be, the more jobs you can do, the more hats you can wear, the more valuable you are and the more likely you are to get your paycheck. Right, absolutely. When you're in the player's position, conflict is never going to work out in your favor, right? especially if it's con or conflict with the decision makers, right? So you might not agree as you get up to those higher levels, there's maybe a little more leeway to at least be able to discuss it, you know, with coaches on a more of an equal footing, but at the end of the day, you work for them conflict with the people who decide whether or not you get to be on that team, you know, over the long haul is not going to work out in your favor. With one exception, and that is the very few guys that are making, you know, $20 million a year and they have multiple years guaranteed and they make 10 times more than the coaches and they have a, a lot more leverage. The average NFL player has zero leverage. Right. Anybody in a rookie deal except the first strander has no leverage. And right. even guys in their fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth years, unless they're on a multi-year deal with multiple year guarantees, they don't have any leverage. Right. And because, no, absolutely. Right. And because teams can eat cap, dead money, they don't care if they've already paid you some money. They'll still cut you because right. they can. I've always felt like, and I don't know if we could, maybe somebody smarter than, than I could quantify this and, and put it on paper, but I've always felt like there is a, a formula or a direct ratio between your ability, how much you're being paid, and how much stuff they'll put up with from a player. Right? If you're, if you're an all-pro – you get away with a little bit more. You get a little bit of leeway, just to your point, a little bit more leverage. And if you're if you're just a rank and file NFL player, it's much less so. It reminds me again. You may remember this, or maybe not. This is a long time ago, back in 2002, 
after I've been drafted by the Seahawks and we're trying to get um, my rookie deal finalized before we head out to training camp. And just as a perfect example of how much leverage you have, it came down to the Seahawks basically not wanting to kind of follow previous year's precedent when it came to the signing bonus because somebody else, you know, a couple spots ahead of me had jumped the gun and maybe signed for a little bit less than they should. And it got to the point where in NFL terms, really insignificant money, you know, a couple thousand bucks, maybe, you know, one way or another. And I believe the answer that they gave was something like, well, go ahead and hold out, see what happens. And uh, that's when it kind of hit me. Like, yeah, you know what? I don't have any leverage at this point. Take the deal and we'll, and we'll move on and get to the point where we hopefully have some leverage. But your, um, your three points are exactly right. Well, I'll follow up to what you said because you're spot on in the, in the sense of it's a sum of your talent and the leverage you have, which is created by what's your contract situation, compared to the hassle factor, the embarrassment factor that players can potentially bring on to a club. And as soon as the hassle factor gets higher, that player's gone. Yep. And so smart guys don't create any hassle. They create no problems, and they hope that the combination of their talent and production and value and versatility and all those things, in combination with their contract status, gives them an opportunity to play another year. You've got to make sure that your lifestyle is consistent with your dream and you don't give a team a reason to short-circuit your career. Right, absolutely. And then I'd like to think that I was some uh, genius for thinking this way. I don't think I really thought about it this deeply or as deeply as you know, we do now when we talk about this. I really just had it in my head that I'm not going to give them a reason to get rid of me. They might they might cut me. They might decide there's somebody better than me, but I'm not going to give them that reason, give them an easy out to get rid of me. And I think that, you know, that kind of plays exactly what you're saying is um, unless you are in a position where you can get away with skipping meetings, being late for practice, whatever it may be, you better, you better toe the line and, uh, and, and do what you're supposed to do at all times. For me, I wanted to be there bad enough. I wanted to be in the NFL. It meant enough to me that I was going to make sure that I just never gave them an excuse um, or an easy out to get rid of me. Well, here's the thing that when you look at the NFL or you look at one team globally, instead of the eyes, through the eyes of one player, this is what you see. You see that certain players, when they have leverage, they use it. And so much so, sometimes they leave the team. When the team makes even the biggest offer, and it hurts a team really bad, when they don't have a franchise tag on a player, when he leaves for less money. So it wasn't an issue of money. They, mm -hmm. The player didn't want to be there anymore. And so that really, really hits the teams in a bad way. So when they have the leverage, which is 90% of the time, they exercise it. Right. And so as a player, when you had that dilemma of, hey, maybe take a haircut on a couple thousand bucks and, and have an opportunity to make a couple hundred thousand bucks, it's an easy decision because you got to pick your you got to pick your spots and pick your fights. Right. You can't battle all the time. Absolutely. No, I agree with that 100%. Okay. So, let's fast forward to free agency. Why don't you share for our audience your perspective on how that went, how you thought it would go, and what you ended up doing and why you did what you did. Sure. And maybe just to give a little perspective, I'll back it up just a little. I was in Seattle in 2002. I spent my first year primarily as a special teams player, a, a third tight end that would come in and short yardage, goal line situation. But you know, felt like given the position I came in at and, and what else was going on um, at the tight end position, you know, I was, I was pleased with how that went. We found out after the fact that kind of the plan for me was you know, maybe come in, put the guy in the practice squad for a little bit and see how he pans out. So to make the 53-man roster and you know, be on the active roster, that was, you know, I felt like that was a really good step. Um, that off season, I had a just a really good off season, or developmentally, physically, and then just on the mental side of the game. And I, I put myself in a position going into training camp where I had a chance to be the starting tight end. Then I, I believe it was the third preseason game. I started that game and I got hurt on like the second play. I was in there, hurt my knee, nothing major, but I'm gonna miss three weeks. Was really bummed, but thought, okay, three weeks, I'll get back at it, you know, and. Uh, We'll get this ready to go. Coming back, you know, a couple weeks after that, kind of easing me back into it. We're getting ready to play the Chicago Bears in October 
I guess that'd be what, 2003 out in Seattle. And before that game, basically the tight end coach told me, you're going to be the second tight end for this game. If it goes well, um, you're, you won't be coming back out. Right. So here we are right on the cusp of it. You know, really excited about uh, you know, achieving that dream. Going to be the starting tight end of the NFL team. Second offensive play that I'm in there, um, I get my foot caught up in a pile a little bit, get hit, and I blow out my knee. Season's over with, right? And so I kind of went in the span of you know less than a year, you know, six months really, of feeling like I was just about there, just within reach, and have it taken away kind of twice almost. So fast forward a little bit, go through a lengthy rehab. The next year was a real struggle. Just physically, it wasn't quite healthy yet, and it was it was a battle. My fourth year in Seattle then um, was able to, you know, basically battle back and, and really kind of solidify a, a role for myself on the team. Successful team up to that point, one of the most successful teams Seattle's had. Went to the Super Bowl for the first time and all those great things. And so then the season's over with. And at that point, I felt like I, I'd really mentally and emotionally invested a lot into of being a part of the Seattle Seahawks. All the relationships I had with my teammates and the trainers and the coaches, really about as good as you could get. And so every part of my being wanted to stay in Seattle. That being said, I was a free agent, right? And Seattle has to make a decision on, on where to spend their money. And kind of the um, feedback we received from them was, we'd like you here, we want you as part of our team, but we don't know what you're worth. Right, so go ahead and, and go out there and kind of explore free agency. Come back to us, and we'll see if we can figure out a way to make this work here in Seattle. But okay, great. All right, so end up taking a trip down to Dallas, meet with them. Just happened to kind of catch them at a time where they were looking to upgrade their kind of their tight end depth a little bit. Um, they had this young guy named Jason Witten who looked like he was going to turn out to be a pretty good tight end. And they wanted to figure out a way to uh, take some of the burden off of him and take some of the hits off of off of him. Um, they end up making you know a, a better offer than honestly what I think I was hoping for and what we you know we anticipated. I remember sitting in the Cowboys' office as I'm as I'm talking to you on the phone and uh, saying this is great. You know, we'll give Seattle a call, get them a chance to match this or make an offer, and uh, you know and take it from there. In my mind, I'm thinking. You know, we're, I remember us talking about, well, this is going to be kind of awkward. How are we going to get these guys to you know, give you a ride back to the airport? But uh, that was the game plan. And then I'm sitting there, and the phone's not ringing. I'm thinking, what, what's Greg doing? What's going on? And finally, you call me back, and basically it was something to the effect of, Seahawks aren't really answering the call. And you know, finally got through to somebody who went and talked to somebody, and the answer was, well, tell Ryan good luck in Dallas. And you know, we've talked about this, I know, several times, but that was the real, you know, cold water in the face moment for me. That was, it wasn't until you told me that on the phone that it really had crossed my mind that I was going to leave Seattle and go somewhere else to play. And uh, we had a, you know, just a real heart to heart conversation. And I'm, I'm grateful for it to this day where you, know, you told me, look, they had their chance. You're not going back to Seattle. Basically you need to, uh, you need to uh, take this deal. So following that, I still, I still was, I think a small part of me thinking, this is, this is, this is hardball. This is how it works, right? The, the Seahawks are just really trying to put the squeeze on us here. And so I was able to, uh, I called the, the Seahawks office and I asked the secretary to put me through to um, coach Holmgren and I had a good relationship with Mike. And, and I said, Hey, here's the deal. Um, get ready to sign with the Cowboys. And he says, well, you know, for goodness sakes, don't, don't sign anything. Give me a couple minutes. So we hang up. I'm thinking, okay, we got this. This is all going to get straightened out. I guess this is how this whole free agency thing works. And he calls me back, and he basically, you know, I'm really grateful for him, um, for his honesty as well. He says, so if this was completely up to me, I would find a way to bring you back. But I'm telling you this, you know, as a as a friend, it's in your best interest to take that deal. And so, so we did. I mean, the rest is is history, I guess. But uh, you know, going through that process of kind of um, seeing how seeing how you know things work behind the scenes and really living it that was uh, that was a heck of an experience. And uh, you know, at the time, you know, if I'm being truthful, I was as silly as it sounds. You know, based on you know, signing a big contract with a 
with an NFL team, I was disappointed to be leaving Seattle. I mean, nothing new. I mean, I know you know that, knew that at the time. But it's funny how uh, you know things work out for work out for the best and work out the way that they're supposed to. So, yeah, that'll be a, that'll be a story for the for the grandkids someday. Here's my perspective: is everybody goes through free agency for the first time, and it's a very unpredictable animal. And I would be lying if I said I knew exactly how it was going to play out, because each and every time it's a little bit different. But there's some common themes to free agency, and that is that when a team allows a player to test the waters. They like him. Obviously, they like you. That's not an issue. But they don't want – they want to get you for the cheap. Right. And they might have their eyes on another player that they think could be better. He's younger. He's going to be cheaper. And most likely, he's going to be healthier. So when you got that trifecta of younger, healthier, and cheaper, that's why guys, once they hit about four years, a lot of them go out to pasture. Mm-hmm. And the, unless another team sees the value of having a veteran presence in that position room, and they may be in a situ- different situation than the team the player was with, that they're, they're not worried about developing some young guy. They want somebody that knows what he's doing. Players get caught up in that, which you did, and you get your feelings hurt a little bit by the team you're with because you've given everything for four years. Your whole identity is connected, connected to the Seahawks. You know, you, you have personal relationships with people in the building you've gone through blood, sweat, and tears with the training staff. You feel like you're a part of the team, and you are. But Ted Thompson being the GM, his job is to constantly change out pieces. It's like he's playing chess. Right. And he's always thinking about he's, – he's got a whole different perspective than the coaches do. So if Mike Holmgren would have been the GM too, you would have never left. Right. But he wasn't. So Ted Thompson didn't have personal relationships with the players. He wasn't a personable type of guy, and he did that on purpose because he needed to be able to cut guys and move guys at will without feeling that tug that coaches feel. Right. And, he, and you know, like Holmgren knew he could depend on you. The offensive staff believed in you. Ted Thompson didn't have a connection with anybody. And he's looking at factors that the coaches don't look at. He's looking at, like, draft day type stuff, height, weight, speed, measurables where the coaches are like looking for smarts, dependability, reliability, you know, trustworthiness, things like that, that matter on Sundays. So there's a a conflict of paradigms here between front offices and coaching staffs. And you're one of those guys, you fell in that sweet spot where one side wants you and the other side, you know what, we go younger, we go cheaper. Right. And in fairness to, you know, the front office types that make those decisions, they're looking at dollars out the door for somebody said as compared to their performance as compared to their health right so I know I mean obviously I I lasted one more year with the way my knee was and in the end that makes the Seahawks front office look look pretty darn smart but uh, you know in fairness you know that's not how a player looks at it that's not how a coach looks at it it's it's more near-term focused or short-term focused and the guys making the money decisions, they got to they got to figure out what, what's best for the team over the next two, three, four years. So, and I have no ill will towards them on that at all. And I think part of the difficulty for me was, generally speaking, I'm a very loyal person, and you know, I kind of always had that mentality. Even though as you go along, it, it changes a little bit. But it's like I said, this is your team, right? I'm part of this. I'm not just some you know, independent contractor that's farming myself out to whatever place wants me to play football and so you've really you buy into that culture and you really believe in what in what you're doing as a group and then to kind of have the the cold reality of professional athletics just hit you in the face you know, that was that was uh no that was that was a real learning experience for me i guess um well, i should it, say one story though if uh if my um loyalty to the seahawks did anything to help this i mean i, I think it did we we were sitting in Dallas again, we're trying to get a hold of, or you're trying to get a hold of the front office people. And at the moment they just weren't returning their calls. They were, they were going through some other stuff that, uh, uh, that exa- uh, same day and people in the agent world or even Seahawks fans will remember the Steve Hutchinson situation where the Vikings offered or the Seahawks had put this transition tag on him and the Vikings kind of tailored their offer to make it virtually impossible for the Seahawks to match it. And so they're dealing with that at the same time, which I think played to a lot of why the lack of response in that moment. Well, the Cowboys then 
misinterpreted our delay in uh, saying yes, and they came back and offered more money. <laughs> and uh, I remember again. I remember that call. He said, "Hey, you're not going to believe this, but you know the Seahawks or the uh, Cowboys think we're we're holding out. We got you know some other deal on the table. They thought we had maybe some leverage. They had no idea that we had zero leverage, zero offers at that point. So uh, me being uh, me having a hard time leaving Seattle actually played in our favor and uh, got us a little more money from the Cowboys. Yep. Ironically, that type of thing happens a lot where perceived leverage means more than re- real leverage. And perceived leverage is when, you know, agents lead to believe that the player's got more going on than he really does or a player playing poker with the team and having the balls to do that, and that's not easy to do. Um, <laughs> in our case, we were just being honest. We were right. just, you know, hey, we were delaying the decision because you wanted to make the right decision, and you wanted to exhaust all possible avenues to stay in Seattle for the same money. Right. And if that was possible, we both knew what you were going to do. You weren't going to move. didn't make any sense. Right. And when it came to light that it wasn't going to be the same money, it made it pretty obvious to you that you needed to make a career move that was going to be better, the best thing for your family and future family. Right. No, absolutely. But not just a better offer. At that point, it was really the only offer. It was, uh, and to your point, it's, I, I had to mentally be 100% positive that that door was closed. And you know, even after, you know, I, I don't remember who it was at the time, if it was uh, 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 Mike Reinfeldt maybe, who, who I, I don't remember, um, he said no. I thought, well, wow, maybe again. I don't know that guy that well. Maybe he's just messing with us. And But after I talked to, to Mike Holmgren and he said it, like, okay, or closed, you know, this is, this is what we're going to do. So yeah, it was a experience I'll never forget. And not to uh, sound like I'm, I'm sucking up because I'm on your, on your show, but you know, something I'll always be grateful for you to, for for, uh, talking some sense into me at that, at that stressful time for sure. Well, I have a few of those calls every year where you can tell that your client really doesn't trust you. This isn't that you didn't trust me, but you, you don't want to hear that information. You don't believe it. You don't like it. And it doesn't make sense. And I think the hardest thing for you was, and I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, so this may or may not have been true, but in your mind, you truly felt like a member of the organization. Like you said, you didn't feel like an independent contractor. You felt like an employee and you were, but once the season's over, every single team in the league looks at all the players differently. Mm -hmm. They reevaluate the player. And if they if they reevaluated you on which what you brought to the table and what you put into it, they would have held you to a higher point than they did because they were measuring you on with your given health, how many more good years could they get out of you? Right. And what would that cost compared to signing a different player or drafting a rookie? And yeah, so, no, absolutely. And I think I mean, that you're exactly right. And it wasn't that I didn't trust you or believe your message. It was more that just wasn't the message I wanted to hear, right? And I think your point is really a good one about how they value you versus how a player values himself. As a player, you, you go into it with the idea of, look what I've done for you. I want you to reward me for what I've done. And the team looks at it as what you've done for us, that's great, but what are you going to do for us? And that's a little bit, of, I think, where that disconnect then happens. So you have somebody like me who's, you know, the, the tires are wearing a little thin and, um, you know, un, uncertain injury situation. That's a different outlook if you're saying, how long is this guy going to be able to help us? And the other party's looking at it like, look what I've done for you. Well, and I would add to that, for any player that plays in the NFL for four years on his rookie deal, he's had to make some sacrifices. Some of them get shot up so they can play in the game. Some of them miss family things because they put the team first. There's a lot more sacrifices than the average fan realizes. And so when you've made that conscious decision to sacrifice other things for your team, you have a a very strong connection to your team. Right. But they don't care. And that's the hard part if they don't care. Yep. And there could be a guy that flies in the wind, irresponsible, doesn't care, has a little bit more talent. And a lot of times a, a team will jump on that player. And fortunately, and almost in a, almost a karma thing, a lot of times that player doesn't pan out. Right. And they should have stuck with the loyal guy. But teams can't help themselves. They're always they're they're trained to get stronger 
younger, faster, better, healthier players every year. Yep, yep. And I'm not here to defend front office people, the NFL, but they their job's on the line as well. Staying pat and giving money to people that just out of loyalty, you know, that can run somebody out of the business pretty quick as well. So it's just like I said, it's, a, it's a disconnect of how much you care versus the people that are making those decisions, how much they care personally about you. So, yeah, those those conversations, you know, like I told you the other day when we spoke, I, I miss having, miss our conversations. I can't, you know, or can't remember how many times we talked about this exact, exact topic. It's, you know, being the first time through free agency like that was obviously, you know, I think a big part of it for me. I probably would have been a little more objective the next time or less emotionally tied to it next time but uh i'm i don't i don't say this just off the cuff or flippantly i i'm extremely thankful for those those conversations especially that that long day in dallas that we spent on the phone together so um if it wasn't for that you know i don't know how things would have turned out i appreciate that well let's jump ryan to you're a very successful professional now you've got two daughters you've been married for how many years married for 17 years now so you've been married for 17 years. Got an eighth grade daughter and a fifth grade daughter. What are their names? Grace and Jenna. Grace and Jenna. What have you taken from your experiences as an NFL athlete that to this day they show up on Monday morning? They show up when you're coaching your daughter's sports teams. You know, I think anybody who, and, and just relating this to sports, I guess, but anybody who's able to kind of excel at a advanced level, whether it's college or, or professional sports, you gain a little bit of a, a different perspective on things. You know, just a, just an understanding of be successful, what is important and and what's not important, and and that ability to focus on those things that are important that you can control. As a business person now, I mean that's how I um, I try to approach approach my business. Is you know in this situation, what can I control? And I'm gonna do everything I can to just dominate a situation that I can control. If it's out of my control, then there's not a lot I can do about it. You know, it's a little bit different being being my own boss. Nobody's necessarily going to fire me, but kind of that same mentality as well that I'm not going to give anybody an easy reason to not do business with me. Now, I'm going to do everything I can to to be the person you know that they want that they want on their side. And then when it comes to you know my daughters, I'm really passionate about the you know, the life lessons you can learn through playing sports. Right, so I'm really involved with the youth basketball program in our town here, and coach my daughter's softball teams. And I just I believe really, really strongly just about those things you learn by being as part of a team, and especially in athletics, things that you just you don't learn in everyday everyday life. You know, my goal for my daughters is not for them to become college athletes or professional athletes. If that happens someday, that would be awesome, and I will be at every single game cheering them on. Um, but my goal for them is to have the experiences I had to learn how to be a good teammate, how to be accountable, and how to how to push yourself outside of your comfort zone, how to be a leader, right? And and learn those things at this age so that whether they play college sports or or not, um those are those traits they can carry with them for the rest of their life just as a as a well-rounded successful person. Amen to that. What is the one trait that one trait that you gained by playing in the NFL that maybe you didn't have before you got there? I would say, I would say the confidence that I could do it. I told you when when I showed up and you see these guys that look like the second coming of Hercules walking around in the locker room, and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, you know, man, I you know, I'm from you know, one double A Northern Iowa. Do I do I fit in here or not? You got guys from, you know, all the all the big name schools, all the big name conferences that you're competing with, and you know, then to, to actually just force yourself out into that in that situation where you're going to compete with these guys head to head, and and seeing that you can do it, right? I you know, kind of going back to our previous point about you know the makeup of, of who makes it and who doesn't and why, but to see those guys that come from you know, have the, have the right pedigree and come from the right school and are you know, maybe drafted higher than you fail or, or not, not be able to stick with it. And then to see those guys that come from you know, the small colleges, the Division three school, 
that you know maybe has borderline athletic ability, um, good enough to be there, but nothing that stands out. And for some reason, you know, they all of a sudden have a seven, eight, nine year NFL career. Like, why is that? I think that's a lesson again you can kind of apply to the rest of your life. So going into a business situation, you're trying to trying to make a sale to have the confidence to go in and do it um, versus the negative thoughts of, you know, am I as good as the next guy that may be in here, the guy that was in here previously? And, uh, again, that's, I think that's one of those skills you learn through, through sports. I 100% agree. And I think high school sports is probably the best level for teaching life lessons because at that age, you know, kids are trying to figure out their identity. They're trying to figure out basically how to be successful. And very seldom, if ever, does an English teacher or math teacher say to a student, hey, you got two minutes left in the test. You know, if you've got a few pages to go, speed it up, give it your best, finish to the whistle. Right. Yeah, right. And so what happens in school, unfortunately, is, you know, they hand out the test and have them turn them in. And in football and in sports and all sports, for that matter, you've got somebody coaching you and challenging you at the same time. And sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. Hopefully it's more positive than negative. Unfortunately, when you get up in the upper ranks, coaches tend to to fire on the negative a little bit more than they should. You don't get your growth and you don't learn how to overcome adversity if you're just taking math class. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. what, just by chance, what was your biggest adversity during your sports career? I would probably, I would, I would say my the knee injury that I had my second year only because it was, I felt I was so close to, you know, getting to where I wanted to be, right. To be the, the starting tight end, for an NFL team, so close, you're right there. And then they have this setback where they say, okay, well, try again in maybe 11 months, right, if you heal up properly. And going, you know, into the into the practice facility at 6 a.m. every morning to grind it out and work on, you know, just trying to, to bend your knee again, that's a long cry from being able to be out on the field and, and competing, you know, for, uh, you know, for your spot on the team. And so, you know, there's a lot of, guys that have gone through that and I, obviously I'm not the only one that's had to deal with that but there's a lot of uh, a lot of time for self-reflection I guess for lack of better words and, and you know really a chance to figure out you know how bad do I want this right how you know how much does this really mean to me I guess anybody that's been through that situation it'd be pretty easy to to just mail it in and say you know I'm good thanks you know it's been a fun experience I'm gonna go back to uh, what I was doing before and so Again, I'm a, I'm a believer in that you know, the greatest adversity gives you the opportunity for the greatest growth. And I think going through that experience for me personally, you know, it certainly did that. It made me, in the in the long over the long haul, a, a, a better person. Quite honestly, to have to deal with that and and to come out on the other side. I agree with that. And Ryan, they talk about redwood trees being the tallest trees on the planet, and trees that are the tallest have faced the most wind. And each and every time they face wind, they, their roots, their root systems grow deeper and wider. And so right. if, a, if a tree grows taller than its root system, it topples over. And so one of the beautiful things about sports is you do face adversity. You don't win every game. You're not the star in every game. And you're not healthy all the time. And you don't have the best coach all the time. And your ability to deal with all those situations makes you stronger. And it really develops your root system, which you can take with you when your sport's over. Right. Absolutely. Okay, Ryan. Well, thank you for being on the show today. I wish you and your family nothing but the best, you and your business. I hope you are continue to thrive. And I hope to have you on again at some time. Yeah, would absolutely love to. And I really do appreciate it. And all the best to uh, you and your family as well, Craig. Thank you for listening to this episode of Pro Mindset. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. You can follow us on our website, promindsetpodcast.com, or on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Pro Mindset Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you the next time.